airway management. Now we've covered innovation and just general airway management a lot. So, but we are going to recap this. Our goal is definitive airway without, that's what I believe sans means. It only makes sense that sans means without. So definitive airway sans hypoxia on the first attempt, on the first attempt. Um, our goal is not to intubate this patient. Well, that's why we're paralyzing them, Floyd. Of course, our goal is to secure the trachea with an endotracheal tube. Yeah, but ultimately, if we don't get the tube, then what? What harm befalls that patient if they're pre-oxygenated, if we abort the attempt before they decompensate, before they desaturate, and then we effectively ventilate them back up and oxygenate them back up and give a presser if needed? What harm befalls that patient? Well, there's maybe some, but not nearly as much harm as if our only goal is to intubate. So ventilation and oxygenation is preferred over intubation. We must aggressively tackle the pre-ox and pre, uh, or not pre, but resuscitation continues through the duration of the procedure. We must aggressively attack this as if someone took your dog and your John Wick. Is that what happened in John Wick? I can't remember can't remember. Uh, So those are our goals. Now, something you should already be aware of, squeezing the BVM harder and faster is not the way to increase the SpO2. Two things improve oxygenation. That is increasing the PEEP and increasing the percentage of oxygen that you are delivering. So, If the SATs are low, the initial step is not to squeeze harder or faster. It is to increase the PEEP and how much oxygen we are delivering. Now, how do we position the patient? We don't want them flat, okay? We want ear to sternal notch with the head of the bed about 30 degrees. This is easily accomplished with a stretcher. Hey guys, welcome back to Core EM. I'm Anand Swami Nathan. This is Core Content for Anyone, Anywhere, and Just in Time. I'm here with one of our PGY4 residents, Ben Cleary. Hello. And behind the camera, as always, is Salil Bandari, one of our other faculty members. He's not going to wave to you guys, though. <laughs> and we're going to do a really quick video looking at the bed up, head elevated position for intubation. Now, this is something that Ben reviewed a couple of weeks back for us on our EM Journal update series in our conference. A paper that was in the anesthesia literature looking at this position for intubation and how it improved our ability to intubate. So, Ben, why would we actually do this position? We've been intubating people flat for a long time, and I'll be honest with you, my success rate's pretty good. So, why change? Why do this bed up, head elevated position? Yeah, well, uh, the anesthesia literature has shown for years that patients get better pre oxygenation and longer safe apnea times in the bed up, head elevated position when compared to the supine position. Uh, Rich Levitan has been talking about this for years. Patients oxygenate better and stay oxygenated longer uh, when standing or, or sitting compared to lying down because less of the alveolar air dependent. Um, makes sense, patients are more comfortable if they're hypoxic when they're sitting up than lying flat. Uh, add to this that with our obese patients, you get that massive tissue off of the chest or abdomen uh, and finally, some anesthesia literature also shows that you can improve glottic views with direct laryngoscopy in this position compared to spine. All right, so if we intubate with the patient up, uh, the first thing is the alveoli, less dependent alveoli, so better pre-oxygenation, longer safe apnea time, so we're going to keep those oxygen saturations up higher for longer. We may get a better look at the glottis uh, according to the anesthesia literature once again, and in our obese patients, we're going to offload some of that mass. So, all right, so let's go ahead and let's demonstrate the actual position. So I'm gonna go ahead and hop up on this bed here. Right, so the patient's, you know, gonna be in the supine position. The first thing to do is align their head with the head of the bed. So oftentimes, you'll have to actually bring the bed into Trendelenburg, and then either the patient will move them up or you can pull up. Once they're in Trendelenburg, uh, you leave them in this position, but then rise the head of the bed to at least 30 degrees. Finally, if you need to, you can get that ear to sternal notch by putting 
a blanket or towel or something like that right behind the shoulders to really get that alignment you want. And we could uh, use our CPR pillow. It takes 15 to 20 seconds. Uh, recommend doing this position during pre-oxygenation and doing during intubation to prolong that safe act. And I will say that, you know, most of the time we're going to want to perform RS on the truck, if at all possible. Uh, our goal should be, if we think we need it, let's try to do it in the ambulance, um, at least when we're starting, until we get some under our belt. Uh, so the pre-ox, how, how do we pre-oxygenate them? What kind of oxygen delivery device uh, do we choose? Well, the answer is as much as the patient will tolerate. In all cases, we should put an end title at 15 under all of these, or not an end title, sorry, a regular nasal cannula end title not to be used for pre-oxygenation. So um, might there be times when a non-rebreather and a nasal cannula at 15 is adequate? There could be. There could be. Um, if that patient tolerates higher, uh, would we want to deliver more O2? Probably. Uh, probably. It's probably safer uh, to deliver higher O2. But again, going back to the traditional ways of performing RSI, the whole purpose of it is a patient is tolerating your pre-oxygenation efforts. They're breathing adequately uh, and spontaneously. You're able to get their SpO2s up easily. Um, and if you can get their SpO2 to 100% with a nasal cannula non-rebreather, then it's probably sufficient. Um, if a patient will tolerate a BiPAP, then that is a great way to pre-oxygenate your patient if they are compliant with the mask, uh, but they're getting fatigued. And then there might be cases where a patient's not breathing adequately and we need to ventilate them. Uh, with a BVM, or maybe they're breathing adequately, but they're not tolerating our ventilation and oxygenation efforts. So we're going to give them ketamine, perform delayed sequence intubation, lay them back about 30 or 45 degrees in the position we just watched, and uh, ventilate them with a BVM. So this is why uh, and how the nasal cannula works for passive oxygenation using a, a BVM here with an aggressive uh, jaw thrust and an oral airway, 25 liters via BVM. Not much happening in the you know, lung. It's uh, collapsed and it really remains so. There are nasal prongs on, but there's uh, no oxygen being administered at this point. Now here, what we're using is 25 liters both uh, through the BVM, but also through uh, nasal prongs with a, a jaw thrust, but no PEEP. You look very closely, there's the occasional alveoli that uh, you can see it's being recruited, but not much happening. So what we're going to do is add a peep valve and dial it up to uh, 10. And so 25 liters via the BVM passively, 25 liters via nasal prongs, aggressive jaw thrust, and 10 of peep. Let's take a look and see what's happening. Pretty impressive, progressively more alveoli being recruited. Now that would not happen the, without uh, a peak valve. Uh, completely expanded uh, just by passively applying high flow oxygen through the BVM and nasal prongs with a good jaw thrust. So that shows if a patient is ventilating effectively, and you place a nasal cannula on underneath at 15 or higher, and then you have the PEEP valve on the patient, then you are essentially providing CPAP, all right? So you're still providing continuous positive airway pressure, even if you're not squeezing the BVM. Um, and in between breaths, you're still delivering that. So that's why we do the rule of 15. And 10 will PEEP. When you let go, it deflates. And apply it, it completely re expands the, the lung. So, again, let's just take a look. Expands and collapses. Now, and let's watch how little look and of see a breath it would take takes to re expand it lung. actively. So, just one partial breath re expands that lung. Now, I'm going to let go. Lung's going to deflate using. 
So if you have a perfect seal and that lung remains inflated, the alveoli remains recruited, it takes very little to reinflate that lung, but the seal must be perfect or you're going to lose all of the recruitment that you have obtained. Uh, so we've covered this. Uh, if you need a review, you can pause and look at that. So how long do we pre-oxygenate? At least three minutes, preferably up to five. So why does the oxyhemoglobin uh, desaturation curve matter here? Because isn't it about if there are acidotic shifts here, if there are alkalotic shifts here? That's right, but you see this slope at the top. There's a flat period, all right? After this flat period, there's a rate at which it drops precipitously. Now, when a patient is adequately pre-oxygenated, there's a very long time before they start to become hypoxic. So if you maximize their SpO2, you get it as high as possible, and you do that the minimum of three minutes of pre-oxygenation, when you stop pre-oxygenating them and while you're attempting to intubate, you won't have to rush. You're going to have a longer period before the patient starts to desaturate. But right around that 93, 92, 91 part, that is when they start to de saturate rapidly and precipitously and then it's hard to pre-oxygenate them from that point. So this is kind of how we want to position the patient here. Now I will admit that we should probably be moving our fingers closer down to the angle of the mandible so that we can pull that jaw forward which is pretty easy to do if the patient's unconscious. Um, and then we can really position that patient perfectly. And for our BVMs, of course, we'll have the elbow, and then we'll have the filter needs to go between the entitle and the mask because if the patient has any stomach contents coming up, then it's not going to compromise your filter, or it's less likely to compromise your entitle. <laughs> This is what it looks like when you do a jaw thrust. That is why a jaw thrust is so important. And then this is an MRI image of what happens when the neck's like this versus like this. So positioning and then jaw thrust will really open up your airway anatomy and make the oxygen that you're delivering more effective. Watch that again. So there are different ways to hold the mask. Ideal is two hands on the mask. One person squeezing the BVM or putting the BVM between their chicken wing. There is another method where you really, if you see the image on the bottom right, if you really put your hand more center and you put where the BVM connects uh, to the mask, if you put that right in the indention here, well, I'm trying to get that in picture, right here, uh, then it will evenly distribute the pressure that you're applying to the mask, so you're not putting too much pressure on one side or the other, and it will enable a better seal, and then you just use your other fingers, reach around to the jaw, and pull it back. Um, <clears throat> so the time at which, a how the, the number of minutes that you have until that patient desaturate is also related to how sick that patient is. So a normal uh, normal adult that is adequately pre-oxygenated, it could take them 10 minutes before they desaturate to uh, uh, SAO2 of 60%. However, a moderately ill patient desaturates faster but who desaturates the fastest? Obese adults and children. They desaturate faster. So when we're talking about our hop killers and our heaven airway criteria, obese 
adults and children. We're not going to RSI children. Now, I'm not saying you can't RSI obese adults. I'm just saying you really have to weigh the uh, pros and cons, the risk versus the benefit of doing so. Now, if you're trying to ventilate or oxygenate a patient and you're only able to get the SpO2 up, let's say you throw a non-rebreather on at 15, 25 liters a minute and the SpO2 is still not coming up, it's only coming up to in the 70s, that patient, by definition, has to have some type of shunt physiology, which is where you have alveoli that are getting oxygen is getting to some of the alveoli but not the others so you have oxygen thrown flowing through the pulmonary arteries and it is not picking up oxygen and offload in co2 so you have a mixing of oxygenating oxygenated blood from the alveoli that are ventilated and deoxygenated blood from the uh, pulmonary artery that was not able to get oxygenated. So if you have a shunt, you must provide positive end expiratory pressure by means of CPAP, BiPAP, or BVM with a PEEP valve. So imagine this scenario. You have a 78-year-old male. You got called for difficulty breathing during response to patient at the... During your response, dispatch advised that the patient was no longer responding. You find the patient slumped over in the recliner, barely responsive, breathing agonally. You throw this patient on a 15-liter non-rebreather. The SpO2 is 84%. They're tachycardic. How would you manage this patient? Well, uh, this patient is likely a candidate for RSI, but not with the current SpO2, and we're going to have to obviously sit them up as we would any other patient or at least raise the head of the bed at least 30 to 45 degrees the higher that you can the better we're gonna have to use a bvm with a peep valve non-rebreather at at least 15 to get their spo2 up so here was a case of bag valve mask ventilation during tracheal in a intubation and what they did was with the intervention group, they used a BVM between induction, all right, so when they administered the sedative and the first intubation attempt. They provided education, they used a PEEP valve, OPA, two handed grip, and a ventilation rate of 10 per minute with only enough tidal volume to make the chest rise and fall. In the comparison group, they did not use a BVM. Uh, they did not use, allow it between induction and the first attempt like they did in the intervention group unless the SpO2 was low or the physician thought it was required. And you can see the comparison of the patients that desaturated who did not get ventilation versus those who did. Now, um, with this information and the science that we shared with a similar study uh, at the beginning of this lecture, it's pretty evident to me that if you provide careful, deliberate ventilations, even if the patient's apneic or between the induction period and the uh, intubation period, that it is safe if you do it very carefully.